The Declaration says that there are certain inalienable rights that we have and that the purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. I don't think most Americans realize how blessed we are. We take so much for granted. Uh, let me just point out the average length of a constitution in the history of the world is 17 years. America has had ours for 233 years. Um, it's what we have, we just take for granted. We've had it for so long, we just assume it's always going to be there, and this is not the case. I've talked to people, we take congressional delegations to Poland, help with congressional delegations, setting up relations with the conservative nations in Europe, and I've talked to people in Poland who have lived through seven constitutions in their lifetime. If you're from South Korea, since South Korea was free, they've been through six constitutions. So we have one, we've been very blessed. I think the reason is John Adams put his finger on it, he said, we're a government of laws, not of men. It's not the opinions of people that guide us, it is written documents that guide us. And so those written documents have been very key. Uh, when you look at those written documents, they don't change over generations. They give us principles. The, the, if you look at scientific principles, the principles of gravity don't change, the laws of gravity, the laws of motion, none of those laws change. Same with the Constitution. It's not written on technology, it's written on principles that do not change across time. And as you understand those principles, that gives longevity to what we do. Now, every elected official we have in America, from dog catcher to president of the United States, takes an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. The problem is, most Americans today don't know the Constitution. Let me let them stats. Right now in America, one of the easiest civic questions should be, how many branches of government are there and what are they? What we know, the legislative, executive, judicial, three, right? Only 24% of Americans can name the three branches of government. Among elected officials, 48% of elected officials cannot tell you the three branches of government. That's the most basic question that there is. We have found recently, in recent weeks, that 57% of Americans have never read the Constitution of the United States. It's really hard to defend something and protect something or uphold something you don't know what it is. You've never read it. So that's where we have to start is knowing what our rights are. And as you know the rights, there's no way you can understand the Constitution without understanding the Declaration. It's interesting that in American federal law, there are four what they call organic documents. Right at the start of, the, of all, all the legal code in America, it lists the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as two of those four. So you can't ignore the Declaration because the Declaration sets for six principles of government, and those six principles they took to the Constitution and in, in the Constitution. Now, I'm not going to go through the six principles, but I, I want to draw to you to your attention. The Declaration says that there are certain inalienable rights that we have, and that the purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. Now, when you look at inalienable rights, how many are there? Well, the Founding Fathers identified roughly two dozen inalienable rights. Uh, there's 16 to 19 that are embedded in the Bill of Rights and the Declaration, but they have about two dozen or so of those inalienable rights. And I think there's easy to say that those inalienable rights are under attack today, and they're under attack by so many who don't even have a clue what they are. They think they can set aside free speech or religion or press or protect. Well, I'll, take, I'll talk about press in a minute. But they think they can set aside those rights kind of arbitrarily for the sake of a pandemic that's come through. And, and let me point out, these are not unprecedented times in America in many ways. If you study history, we've had a major pandemic about every 15 to 18 years throughout American history. You can start back 1633 with the yellow fever pandemic, or excuse me, the smallpox. You can go to yellow fever. We've had scarlet fever pandemics. We've had measles pandemics. We've had several cholera pandemics. We've had all sorts of different flu epidemics. I mean, just there's so many. So this is nothing new. Uh, and by the way, point out, as much as we're hearing about how lethal this thing is, if you go to the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, the mortality rate in cities like Philadelphia was 25%. So let me set the stage here. There's 2.64 million people in Dallas County. If we had had the same mortality rate they had in the yellow fever epidemic of, of 1793, we would have 600,000 Dallas Countyans dead right now. We have 111 dead. This is nowhere close to the mortality of previous epidemics. If you look at something like the smallpox epidemic, Today, the, the COVID mortality rate is one one hundredth of one percent. That's what it is right now. The smallpox epidemic of 1633, the mortality rate was 70 percent. So out of 330 million Americans, we would have roughly 240 million dead right now mortality rate. So this is not a mortality that we, we regret every single life that's been lost. But the seizure of power over something that supposedly is so dangerous, oh my goodness, this is only the eighth most dangerous thing in America right now. All the COVID deaths put together, there's seven things that have a much higher death
death rate in America than COVID does. So why do we lose constitutional rights to something that's number eight on the list? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So when you look historically, but that, that comes from knowing something about history and the Constitution. So what, what, what rights are now, now, I will say the difference today with all the previous pandemics is how our public officials are responding to it. It's not that we haven't had them before and it's not that government hasn't been involved before. The response today is unprecedented. If you look at the attack on our rights, let me take the First Amendment. The First Amendment has five guaranteed rights in the First Amendment. By the way, only one out of a thousand Americans knows what those five rights are in the First Amendment. If you want a homework assignment, learn those five rights and then ask all your friends what those five rights are. Just get them to think about the five rights in the First Amendment. Freedom of speech and press, and petition and assembly and religion. Five simple things. Four of those five are under direct attack in COVID. The only one that, that the uh, public officials have not gone after is freedom of the press. I wonder why that is. They've left the press completely alone. They've gone after religion, petition, assembly. They've gone after everything else. They haven't done. We, we've had the Second Amendment come under attack. The mayor in Jackson, Florida, or in Jackson, um, in Jackson, Mississippi said, you know, during this COVID thing, we're going to have to suspend all your Second Amendment rights to conceal carry. You can't do that anymore. No, no, no. That, that's not a reason to take away inalienable rights. You have the same thing when you get to the Third Amendment. The Third Amendment simply says government's not to set up camp in our house. They've done that. They've moved in. They're doing social distancing, even in certain homes, telling people what they can and can't do in their homes. And they, no, no, no. Third, Third Amendment says you can't do that. The Fourth through the Eighth Amendments are what we call the due process clauses. There's a number of amendments there, and they're all based on the, the belief that we're innocent until proven guilty, unless it's COVID, and then we're all guilty until proven innocent. So we're not going after those who have COVID. We're going after all the people who don't have COVID. We're not going to let you talk about it. not going to let you assemble about it. And, and see, we go through all these enable rights, and there's a bunch there. But if you look at, as I mentioned, if you look at all those in the Bill of Rights and elsewhere, you get 16 to 19, depending on how you break them out. Founding Fathers said roughly two dozen. So what do we have that we're not talking about? Well, Founding Fathers said you have an inalienable right of expatriation. Now, we don't really know what that is today because we don't study that. But here's another one. Founding Fathers said you have an inalienable God-given right to earn a living. And it's the duty of government to protect that. Let me... The government has the same responsibility to protect your right to earn a living as it does to protect your freedom of speech or press or anything else. Let me give you a quote from, from Thomas Jefferson in his second inaugural address. It's a great quote. He says, what is necessary to make us a happy and a prosperous people? That's a good question. Don't know how you would answer that. Here's how he answered it. He said, what's necessary to make us a happy and a prosperous people? He says, a wise and frugal government that shall leave citizens free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and not take from the mouth of labor the bread it is earned. This is a sum of good government. So good government gives you the right to earn a living and doesn't take it away from you. Now, that's, an under, that's a fundamental understanding they had. Now, uh, let me be real clear. It's not the government's responsibility to give you a job or to make sure you have a job. You do that. But once you get a job, it's the government's responsibility not to take it away from you and to make sure that you can keep the income that you make. It's not their responsibility to give you a job. So. So that right to have a job and earn a living is fundamentally an inalienable right. If you understand the Declaration, the purpose of government is to protect inalienable rights. That's what the Constitution guarantees. So that should have been done all along. Shutting businesses down this way is unprecedented. That is the one thing that's never happened in any previous pandemic is complete, complete closure of business. It's never happened before. That's what's unprecedented. But then we know less of the Constitution today than in any previous generation. So we've allowed it. We've put up with it. You really can't do that. So let me close with a couple of quotes. One quote comes from George Washington. George Washington, as he was leaving public office after leading, uh, in, in, leading in some way in America, militarily, politically, some way, for 40 years in America, as he's going out of office after two terms as president, this is what he, he, he reminded us. It's really a warning, if you will. He says, it is important that the habits of thinking in a free country, and free country, you need to have free thinking habits, you need to think freely. He says, it's important that the habits of thinking in a free country country should inspire caution in elected officials that they confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres. He says... He said the spirit of encroachment, that is the spirit to go beyond what's constitutional, 
tends to create a real despotism. It's a great warning. You stay within the Constitution, your freedoms are guaranteed. You get without that, you start losing your freedoms. But again, it goes back to knowing the Constitution. And again, we don't teach that in schools like we used to. We don't have the civic stuff we used to. Americans don't know it. So here's the final quote I'll give you. It's a challenge, if you will. Um, and by the way, let me point out that this stuff is being litigated. Uh, we talked to an attorney yesterday who now has legal action going in 40 different states. He's a Supreme Court attorney. That, that we work with so many national legal groups that are so aggressive on this, and we got a decision two days ago on one of the government officials who was trying to suspend rights. This is what the Circuit Court of Appeals said. I love this. They said, we will not allow the Constitution to sleep during this pandemic. Amen. Exactly right. And I'll tell you, those, those 191 judges that have been appointed in the last three years, they're more constitutionalists than I've seen in my lifetime. And those are the guys that are starting to give this kind of decision. So they're looking at the Constitution first. However, here's the final quote I have from you. It comes from John Jay. He's an author of the Federalist Papers, one of the greatest commentaries ever written on the Constitution. He's an original justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. Here's what he advised in his day. He says, every member of the state ought diligently to read and study the Constitution constitution of his country and to teach the rising generation to be free. He said, by knowing their rights, they will sooner perceive when their rights are violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. Seven verbs there. Read and study the Constitution and teach it. Then know your rights so that you can perceive when they're violated and then you can defend and assert your rights. Those seven verbs, that's, that's a quote that every one of us should memorize. As a citizen of the United States, we need to know our Constitution. We need to teach it to the next generation. It is knowing, defending, and asserting our rights that has made America different from every other nation in the world. We've got to keep doing that today. God bless you guys. Let's give it up to David Burton. Y'all need to Google all of his books and his tapes. It's amazing, the amazing amount of information.